welcome to Ask Me Anything. Your chance to ask the IT Pro TV subject matter experts questions live. Here's your host, Don Pizzette. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to another episode of Asks Me Anything, the show brought to you by IT Pro TV, where you, the viewer, get to ask questions to our subject matter experts, or SMEs as we like to call them, thus the Asks Me Anything. Our residence me today is going to be Mr. Daniel Lowry here in studio with me. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Hola, como esta? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, buenos noches, uh, something of... Uh, Ah, uh, whatever. There, there, that's it. It was it, close. Three semesters of Spanish that's right there. That, that's that's right. all I got. Sorry. <laughs> I am not a culture. Mrs. Williamson person. would be proud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> das Vidanya? Yeah, that's Russian. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, we are going to be diving into questions. Questions that come at us from you, the viewers, right? So, you might be asking yourself your first question, which is, how do I ask a question? And it couldn't be easier. Actually, probably could be easier. Uh, but you'd have to be in the room to make it easier. Yeah. If you are remote, though, just go to Twitter. Post your question on Twitter. Make sure you use hashtag AsksMeAnything, and we will see it with our all-knowing eyes. Actually, our always watchful social media team <laughs> will we'll see it. <laughs> and they feed it to me in the background, which is pretty darn handy because I'm not good with social media. Uh, but we get those questions, we answer them, and we try and answer as many questions as we can. I'll be honest with you, though, we do prioritize some questions over others especially the questions we receive via the IT Pro TV Q&A forums. If you're an IT Pro TV subscriber, go to itpro.tv, click on the Q&A link at the top of the page, go in there and post a question in our forums. We aggregate those. We answer them here. We always make sure to answer those. And then we start moving through our social media questions, and we do a pretty good job getting through all of them. But uh, don't feel slighted if we run out of time. If we run do run out of time, we do try and save the questions to get to them in the next uh, episode when questions we can. Questions are still good later, right? They, yeah. They're sealed for freshness. Well, unless <laughs> the question is like, what are you doing tomorrow? In which case, that has a bit There's of a time a limit. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. It's only a day away, I hear. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, before we break into a musical number, oh, yes. uh, you could, we could get a, uh, what would you get for that, a Tony? Uh, uh, a Tony? If we, right. Oh, yeah. That's, if we break uh, into a musical right. number... We could work on our EGOT. That's right, our All right. Broadway play of <laughs> questions that asks me anything. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into what we actually get paid for here, which are uh, IT-related questions. And, oh, you know, normally at this point, I talk a little bit about what your area of expertise is. Daniel is our resident uh, security dude. And uh, a little well, bit of Linux? A little bit of Linux, a little bit of security, a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, definitely spend some time in that realm, have uh, my CISA Plus and CEH and blogs and Twitter sphere and you name it, go to conferences. It's a lot of fun. I find it entertaining uh, and scary at the same time, just because you're like, oh, we have to unplug everything. That's yeah. that's the key. Times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see uh, how scary we can get here with our first question of the day, which uh, we've already previewed because I'm going out of order. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, so our first question is coming from us out in the Twitter sphere. It is, what is the difference between threat vulnerability and risk. And this is a, a common question we get from people who are studying for exams mm -hmm. because in real life land, a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but if you're going to be taking a test, they're not all the same, are they, Daniel? Well, hold on, they're not the same? Uh, uh, cut, cut. <laughs> they're spelled <Okay>. different <laughs> yeah. at a minimum. Uh, Don, Don is actually very, very correct on this. A lot of people think, aren't, aren't they kind of the same thing? And I can see where you get that because there was a time when I was like, aren't they kind of the same thing? And uh, until you find out, no, no, they're not. They actually have a difference. I was actually talking to Zach about this very topic not, uh, not too long ago, and we came up with a really interesting analogy to try to solve the problem with the confusion that wraps itself around these three little special terms that are uh, in the secure security sphere. So what we came up with is to think of like a boxer. If we were boxers, so if Don and I were boxers, we both have threats, we have vulnerabilities, and we have risk, okay? So hopefully this makes this a little bit easier to understand because everybody understands the idea of getting punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's bad, right? So if you break it down like this, a threat would be the fact that I could possibly punch Don in the face in a fight and Don could punch me back, right? Those are threats. We both have that looming over us in some way. It's not necessarily going to happen, but it has a possibility of happen. Therefore, it is a legitimate threat. 
A vulnerability would be if Don knew that I was blind in my right eye, like I'm Rocky Balboa over here. I've been in one too many scuffles, and I've, I, I can't see out of my right eye. He learns this, and therefore now he understands that I am vulnerable to his left hook coming in to the right side of my face because I don't see it very well until it's already on me. So I'm vulnerable. That's my vulnerability. Now, Don is able to exploit that vulnerability and actuate the uh, threat of me being punched in the face by going through that vulnerability. Now, the risk is how likely is that to occur? Now, maybe Don's got a little week left that's powder puff, and he doesn't want to throw it out there because it leaves him exposed in some way. So you start to see how these things break down. So the risk is how likely is Don to try to attempt to exploit my, th my, my vulnerability, to be a threat to that vulnerability. And that's how I like to break these down now as we work this out. So a threat is a potential uh, uh, attack against your system. A vulnerability is the inroad that a threat, could a threat could exploit. And the risk is how likely is that to happen and what would be the fallout if it did occur. So that's the difference between those three different terms. Hopefully that now makes it a little bit easier for you to understand because I I totally get the fact that that seems super confusing the first time that I ran across it. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned the term exploit, mm -hmm. which uh, also gets kind of factored into this, right? Because a vulnerability is is a, a weakness that you have, but unless somebody can exploit it, we don't necessarily need to worry about it, right? So Correct. it's almost like a fourth term we need to throw into that mix. Yeah, it would be kind of. I guess it would be under sub threats. So you'd have threat proper, and then underneath that would be. Uh, exploitability or the exploit itself properly. So if the, the threat would be that they could exploit my vulnerability. So again, yes, good good job, Don, on, on bringing the word exploit into that conversation so that we don't leave anything out, no stone unturned, right? Yay words. <laughs> Yay words. Sadly, you know, IT is a lot of worrying about words and acronyms and just knowing the right language to talk about mm -hmm. things. In, in real life, when you're talking to somebody, it might not matter so much, right? But when you're reading a textbook, when you're talking to other security professionals, using the correct terminology makes a makes a big difference in how we communicate and how we communicate effectively. So. That's right. You got to have that that uh, conversation. Everybody's on the same page. If you don't have share a, a, a common language, you're not going to be able to have a very good conversation on what it is you want to talk about. So being able to understand what each one of those terms mean in the idea that that's what everybody else thinks they mean. That's going to go a long way with you and being able to answer questions if you're taking an exam or just having conversations with somebody. Maybe you're doing an interview and they're asking you about threats and vulnerabilities and exploits. They probably know what that means as well, so they want to make sure that you do. All right. Well, I know that if you and I are both boxers and we're in the <laughs> ring, I need to threaten whoever's managing the weight classes. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. Let's let's uh, let's move on to our next question, which actually falls really well in line with threats. And uh, this one came at us from Twitter. What exactly is XSS and uh, or XXS? It, it's XSS is what they meant, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Cross-site scripting and and how does it work? So, cross-site scripting attacks are super super common. Very few people actually understand how they work. So, Daniel, what exactly is XSS? All right. So here's XSS in a nutshell. Basically, so Don laid it out for you. Cross-site scripting. You are actually able to take a script, usually JavaScript, and you're able to get a third party, a website basically, to execute that code, right? That, that's what we call bad in the security world. Uh, you don't want that to happen. And even, even though as much as you don't want that to happen, it's quite common. Yeah, you will see it very often. And this comes from the fact that it, you're not doing proper sanitization, you're not filtering user inputs, things of that nature to keep those those things from happening because the, the scripting language has a specific set of syntaxes that you're going to use. So I want to take a look for those syntaxes. That's how we can protect against it. But cross-site scripting, you have a couple of different types. One is stored and the other is reflected. There's also a DOM-based ones. But typically when you, when you start having the conversation about cross-site scripting, you're either talking about stored or you're talking about reflected. Now let's, let's see the difference between the two. Stored is where I actually put the code onto their website and it stays there through some mechanism that they've given me as the end user to actually input data so that they will keep it for um, further down the road, for the future use, right? 
And you'll see this with things like comment boxes and message boards. What do they do? They give you a format via the web so that you can type in how much you think that video was stupid and, and say safe, right? And it does, and it stays there. And then as people come to that website, they can come down and look and say, oh, you know, uh, Hot Guys 77 thought this video was stupid because it's still there. But instead of writing, this video was stupid, I put some JavaScript in there, and you're not sanitizing that input. What's going to happen is when a user comes by and they click on that link and they go to that page, well, the server's going to execute that code, and their browser's going to execute that code, and you're gonna, they're going to get that whatever that code does. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. So that's bad, right, because it could be malicious code like, you know, upload this file or give me a session cookie or do this or do There's plenty of things you can make it do. Uh, after that, once you've got the ability to say, I can write code and you will do it, sky's the limit after that. Then there's reflective, which is a little more involved. It's a, it's a little different. But basically what you're doing is you're saying, I am going to go a roundabout way. It's not going to store the code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create like a link. And I am going to send that link via maybe like a phishing email to an end user. Once they click on that link, it's going to execute code and it's going to, well, it's going to have your server execute the code for me. And it's going to send, it's going to do something like, typically this is how we do uh, session cooking. I'm oh, sorry, session hijacking through cookies. So if you've got a session cookie, I can steal that by putting in, Hey, don't forget to add your document.cookie and then send it over here to me. Here, here's the web and you give it to their IP address port and whatever. And you've got a little uh, piece of code over there. That's accepting that. And once it gets it, it jumps it to a file. And now I've got a session cookie. Once I have that session cookie, I can throw that into my browser, use some sort of cookie manager in the browser, say, here's my cookie for when I visit this website, which is legit, but it's for the other user, right? And now it thinks, that website now thinks I'm the user. Now that's all the theoretical stuff. I can give you a really quick and, and dirty example of this, just the basics. And this is how you test for this. This is a, a very simple test. Let's go to my computer real quick. I'll open a browser. And I, I typically have like Metasploitable up and running. So I will go to Metasploitable because I know it's off the top of my head. Dot, yeah, 145. And DVWA and Multiliday, they, they're basically uh, pre-configured badly a web application, so you can test these kind of things. So if you wanted to play with that, you could. So let me log in, admin, and I think it's just password. It says at the bottom. You'll notice it's got stored and reflective. I'll show you the store because it's easier to show. So here we do. We have this, um, uh, what is this? Um, basically like a, a message board is what it looks like. And I can put my name. I can say my name is Hacker, and my message is you've been, you've, you've, <laughs> you've been, uh, I guess I could have left the three, been hacked. Like so, right? And then sign my guestbook. What does that do? It puts this code down or this uh, message down here. Every time someone visits the set page, they'll see that. But what if I put something like script alert? Ah, uh, well, I can't do it here. They're actually like I'm limited to characters here, so it's not allowing me to put that in here. So maybe I can put it in the message. So I'll say hacker, hacker. There we go. And then let's see if I can put it in the message. So script. So this is just JavaScript or HTML script. Alert and say XSS. Like so. Close my script tag. Hopefully this works. I might have to. Uh, if it doesn't, then I would have to do more advanced things like open up Burp Suite and intercept the name field so that I could interject, interject and not have the boundaries of their filter stopping me from saying, well, you only get 20 characters there or whatever. That would stop me. So we'll sign this guest book. And now you'll see down here, it's not allowing it. So that's what exactly what I have to do. I have to go in there and say, oh, uh, let's see if the reflected will allow me to do it. Sometimes, you know what? I bet the security's on high. That's what it is. They, they, they default the security to high. So let's lower the security down and just change that to low, hit submit. Now I bet we get a little more characters. Well, I mean, that's there. a good demonstration, though, of how it's up to the web developer. They exactly. can secure against this. It's just if they forget and miss it, that's when you're vulnerable. That is exactly right. So this website, by default, is doing the correct thing, but we want to show you what it looks like when they're not doing the correct thing. So I'm going to change that. So let's see if I'm able to now throw that script tag in there and then say alert. Nope, it's not allowing me to do this. So I, the, I will have to like start Burp Suite, intercept this as it goes, change that to my script 
So this is a, this is a little more in, involved in playing around with this, which I can do. I mean, we got the time. What the heck, right, Don? <laughs> what the heck? These, so, uh, we'll give these people their money worth. The world is our oyster, that's right? right? I'm starting Burp Suite here. Well, I'll go ahead, and while that's firing up, I'm going to turn on my... Oh, hello, yes. Next that, start Burp. And let's get this working with the proxy. And, of course, Burp's just going to vie for attention. I know. You're a, you're an impet, imp, impetuous child. Let's go here. Preferences. Down and below. while he's setting that up, uh, for you viewers out there, if you're not familiar with Burp Suite, it's a, a collection of tools that allows you to really to, to penetration test web applications. But you can intercept web application communications, acts kind of like a proxy, and you can manipulate it however you want. Well, attackers can do that. I mean, it's the basic premise of a man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, so Daniel is going to man in the middle attack himself, That's which exactly right. is um, not so much a man in the middle. It's a yeah. man, man on I don't know uh, something uh, attacks. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's weird. But that's exactly right. I'm I'm going to intercept my own data because I want to bypass the control mechanisms that it's that's holding. So hopefully it's will work. Uh, I've got the proxy area. The intercept is on, which is good. This is what we want. We want it to intercept the traffic as it goes. So I'm just going to name this hacker. And say hacker, and then sign the guestbook. And now you'll see that the data is being intercepted. And if you look right there, you'll see txt name equals hacker. There's the txt message, which was hacker as well. And I can go in here, and I can actually say, send that to the repeater. Run over the repeater. And now I can change the, the parameters, as it were. So now if I... Say, you know what, oh, hacker, let's get out of there, and I'll try to put my script tags in there. Hopefully it's not like URL encoded and i got to go even farther down the rabbit hole, but this is the idea. I'm, I'm hoping this will work here. Alert, uh, XSS. Oop, I forgot my close. There we go. Don't forget that. It's absolutely necessary. Script, close it out. Here's hoping. Fingers crossed, everybody. I hit go. And then if I render this, it does, it looks like we might have action here. Let's see what happens. Let's go back to this page, stored, but it did not do it. I must have done something here. Let's see here. It's seen it here, but it's not seeing it over here. I noticed that this, oh, you know, <laughs> the proxy's on, Daniel. Let's turn it off. And there we go. And there we go. See, this popped up. It was an alert message, and that was the script that ran. So now I know this is vulnerable to cross-site scripting because I got that alert message to pop up. Now I can get more in-depth with my code and get it to do more devious things. Yeah, and this usually falls down to things like uh, uh, failure to input validation, failure to use HTTPS for communication. Fail you know, there, there's a number of failures that go together to make this possible. And so it is a, a widespread problem. You'd be surprised that a lot of the, the bug bounties that are out there or penetration test finding reports are usually just packed full of cross-site scripting stuff because it's, it's easy for a developer to accidentally fall into that. And then you end up with a site that is not secure or a site that for its true intent and purposes is secure, but for what it's presenting to the end user is not secure at that point. Yeah, exactly right. And there's cool, like it's a cat and mouse game, that's for sure when it comes to the developers trying to secure it and the uh, attackers trying to get past it. So if you look up things like, um, I think OWASP actually has a really robust uh, cheat sheet for cross-site scripting that if you're a developer, you need to know all about that thing and take a look and see how you need to be setting up your filters so that they do keep this from happening. Uh, so that, that could be definitely worth your effort to, to take a look at. But other than that, that's cross-site scripting wrapped up in a ball. That's the basics of it. That's how it works. You're just taking code. You're putting it onto a server so that when people visit, it it executes said code, and you get you get shells. <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, our, our next question, which also came to us via Twitter using hashtag asks me anything, is along the similar lines, right? So um, that second question was, you know, what is cross-site scripting, and, and how does it work? Now we've got, could you explain buffer overflow attacks like I'm five, right? <laughs> so explain like I'm five. Buffer overflow attacks, we, we hear that term all the time, but very rarely is it ever explained exactly what that, that means or, or how that works. So, so can you do that for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to do the like I'm five business because there is a bit of complexity to it. Um, 
But at the end of the day, if you understand some basic concepts, you should be able to understand buffer overflows. They're they're a very it, they're difficult to pull off. They they take some time and some effort, and some uh, wherewithal, knowledge wise. But I think that too much is get made. I think we we uh, want to tip look how smart I am hat too much when it comes to these things when they're actually kind of simple if you understand some of the terminology. So let's talk about buffer overflows. What is a buffer and how do you overflow it is basically the question that's being asked. Well, a buffer is a, a, a piece of memory. It's a chunk of memory that is designated to hold data, right? So very simple. Hopefully that's a, a like I'm five kind of explanation that I'm gonna allocate this little piece of memory over here and when I need it, I'm going to put some some code in there so it can hold it, or maybe it's just static data that I need to gain access to from time to time, and that's what it is. So that's a buffer. Uh, you also see these called registers. These are things that are in the CPU that the CPU uses to say. Uh, I, I've also I've heard them say, oh, they're like pockets on a on like a carpenter's vest. So a carpenter has nails in one, screws in the other, rivets, and uh, you know buttons or something, right? And when he needs buttons, he pulls the buttons out of the buttons pocket. Well, that's a register. That's a buffer. That's, that's what I want. Well, all these registers are going to hold different bits of code when, it, when a program gets executed. So when I say, I want to run notepad.exe, and I double-click that, that, that executable, it loads that program into memory, and that memory is chopped up into certain little bits. A little piece of code going to this register, a little bits of code going to that register, and when it needs to do the functionality within the program, it goes, oh, that's over here in this register. We'll call it register A, right? And we've got register B, C, and D. There's typically four, and then there's two registers within. It gets, it gets heady after that, but we're going to try to keep it like on five, right? So A, B, C, and D registers. Well, what if I have a program that says, hey, uh, you want to log in? Here's a username and password box. Perfect. We actually just kind of saw this with the cross-site scripting, where it said, I'm only going to allocate X amount of characters for your username. Well, that's a, good, that's a good practice. That's a good thing. Because if I say, yeah, put in a username, and I just say, whatever the username is, and I'm going to put it in this register, well, that could be Don, that could be Daniel, that could be Billy or Sally or Sue or whatever. But if I'm, a ba if, if I'm not doing my due diligence as a, as a developer and saying, you know what? Most people's names aren't much longer than, you know, 20 bytes. So I'm going to allocate 20 bytes for that. And they just say, please give me your name. And they take that data in. That's where a problem could come in. Because once I input my name and I say, my name is Daniel, and the program reads that in, what does it do? It's going to put it into one of those buffers, one of those registers. It's going to hold it. It's going to say, that's yours. That's where you go. But if I say, my name is Daniel, and it's a thousand characters long, was the programmer expecting a thousand character name? Probably not. Well, does the buffer that he allocated to put names in hold a thousand characters? I don't know. Let's test it and find out. So I feed it Daniel with a thousand characters. If it crashes the program, I know that he wasn't expecting a thousand characters to go in that that username field, and I know I have I might have a way in which I can exploit a buffer overflow. So what will happen is is once it gets to, uh, it fills up that register, it says, "Well, I don't have any more room to hold those thousand names. I got I've got five hundred A's in here from from the name Daniel. I've got five hundred more as an I E L to go, uh, in I E L to go. What do I do?" And he goes, "Well, I'm just gonna spill it over." into this other register, because it's got room, I'll just, hopefully it can take it. That's what we mean by an overflow. So I'm spilling data in, from one register into another. Now, a lot of people will try to tell you, it's like, uh, you have the champagne glasses all lined up and I pour the champagne in the top glass and it spills down, right? And, and it is like that, but it's also, uh, think of it like this, I'm spilling the champagne in such a way that it lands in the bottom glass that I want it to land in, right? It only takes the path that I know that it's going to take. I, it will take this path every time. And I know what that path is so that when the champagne reached that bottom glass, well, that champagne is my malicious code. And that bottom glass is a register that says, my job is to execute code. That's what I want to do. So I find a register that says my job is to execute code. 
I make sure that I can spill my champagne down into that glass and that when the champagne reaches that glass, the first thing it does, the first piece of data that it gets is the beginning of my executable malicious code. That is a buffer overflow. So I take advantage of the fact that they weren't checking their input on, uh, on data, on how much could it, could it could take. I overflow the register that it, the space that it takes up in that register, spills into other registers until I finally land into a register that will execute code. And I, through various and sundry means, make sure that that is executable code of my own design and it executes the code, I get shells. Now, Daniel, is this a, a possible spot where uh, privilege escalation can happen? Like, if I if I overflow a buffer that's mm-hmm. being written to just by a regular user space, and it overflows to a register or buffer, or whatever that that is being called by a privileged account, would would that the, I guess then the privileged account would execute that code? That's exactly right. Whatever that program is running as, whatever user account started it, whether it be a service account or God forbid an administrative account. Uh, or just anything that might be above a standard user, then they are going to gain the privileges of whatever user that was. So if that is an administrative account, then yes, you will have administrative privilege when you execute your code. So um, without going too crazy, because this will get beyond explain like I'm five, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> so if I can figure out the size of a buffer, mm-hmm. which you can just do fuzzing or testing Correct. or whatever to figure out where that where that limit is. Yep. So now I know when I can overflow it, and so then I can start my malicious code right afterwards, knowing that's going in some other buffer. Correct. Now, if, if I don't know what that other buffer is, how how do I know what code to feed it to exploit whatever that other item is? Like, how, how does somebody solve that mystery? Is it just trial and error? Um, so there are ways to figure out where the uh, executable registers are, right? So when you break down a program to its, its base components, it's ones and zeros, right? The computer, the... The CPU reads it in as ones and zeros and executes a series of switches inside of it. And and there you go. You have execution. Right above that, you have assembly language, which is what every program breaks down into. It'll eventually hit assembly and then ones and zeros. If I can make it assembly and I can look for specific types of of, um, instructions, that's what I'm looking for. So I can actually, I can get a copy of the program. This is typically how this is done. Is I go, oh, you're running this version of this email client, or you're running this version of this FTP server. Well, I can go get a copy of that FTP server, stand up a sandboxed environment, and I can run it through a debugger. And the debugger is going to allow me to find out where those areas are, so that when I get to around to writing my executable code, I can go, it goes right here. And through fuzzing, I'll, I'll figure out, okay, so up to this point, I'm in this register. Then I go to this register, which will allow me to jump to an executable portion of a register. And that's what I'm looking for. And then I just make sure after that, I, I put together this big long string of the fuzz uh, text, the um, hex code for the register that I want to jump to that's going to execute code. And then the next thing is going to be my shell code, basically. Now, a million years ago, I went through a little phase where I was I was learning a lot of this stuff, yeah. and uh, I I was using a, a Windows debugger called Black Ice Defender that let you. I just, remember that. Yeah, it was yes. an awesome. Yes, program. it was. Well, when when Windows went to protected memory, it kind of went out the door, and yeah. that was it. So, are there other modern modern debuggers that have stepped into that place? Now, I haven't stayed current on the field, so I don't know. Like, oh you, yeah, do you have some examples? Uh, yeah, uh, Immunity is great. It's free. It also has uh, these modules called Mona. You can go to GitHub and, and download them and install them. Super easy to get it up and running. The modules are really great because they'll help you find if the registers that you. Uh, so I'm 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 looking for a register that has a command jump to ESP, which is a red, which is another register, which is specifically designed to execute code. I'm looking for jump ESP. Is it protected? The Mona modules will help you with that. So I always say um, immunity debugger is a really good one uh, for both platforms. It'll, it'll, it'll run under Linux or, or uh, Windows as well. So really great stuff. There's OlliDBG. I think there's GDB in Linux, which runs from the command line. It's like in the command line itself. You just run it and you're off to the races. So that takes a little more wherewithal because it's all you know, text-based. So, but yeah, all, all of those and go out there and start playing with them. There's a lot of them that are free, uh, either free to try or free to use. Uh, some of them have full functionality. Some have limited functionality. Um, I think immunity is probably the de facto at this point. 
Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, um, I think, uh, well, before we got technical, it, yeah. it certainly was explaining <laughs> like someone was five. So, hopefully, uh, hopefully, yeah. excellent description there. All right. Let's, uh, let's continue on with our security odyssey. Uh, our next question coming at us from hashtag asks me anything is how can I be more secure when browsing the internet? And I'm going to stipulate here. I'm going to stick a rule on this, which okay. is you can't just say, don't use the internet. Ah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I if we want to be that. more secure, what, what, what can we do? Because it's a dangerous world out okay. there. Okay. You turn off all your electrical devices, and that's the end of it. It's a ha. Gotcha. Didn't say. Just turn off the internet. But no, Don's right. right. I want <laughs> I want to use the internet, but I want to do it as safely as possible. Really, there's various and sundry ways. There's plenty of different ways in which you can do this. Um, the ones that stick off right at the top of my head are use a VPN. Right now, you're encrypting all your traffic, and uh, if you find a good one that's out there, a lot of them are paid for. You can even stand up your own VPN service and um, with uh, like OpenVPN if you wanted to do that. Use AWS for that. That is more technical than paying for a service, which is super easy, and then going in your browser and saying, "Use this proxy service," uh, which we saw how to do that with Burp and Firefox. It's very similar throughout IE and Chrome as well. It's just some area that says hey, I want to use a proxy. Here is my proxy server. Here's the port that it uses. And now all that data is getting encrypted as you jump around the internet. Tor is another way in which you could do this. It's not quite as effective, I think, as proxying, to be honest with you, um, just because of the randomization. Plus, you can get like a, a bad user experience. I say bad, a, a not optimal user experience. Let me put it that way. Not optimal user experience. You are sharing the uh, the dark web with a bunch of bad people. So there is that happening. But you're doing that on the regular internet as well. Um, uh, you can, can see some slowdowns because of all the jumping around that it does, the relaying that happens. If the endpoints where you jump out of isn't using encryption, that's also a problem. So I typically tend to lean on proxies. If you wanted to be like super duper secure, you could do VPNs with Tor. And that, that would definitely make it more robust. But, again, your user experience is probably going to go to a slowdown at that point. Well, and, and we have to remember it's not perfect as well, right? right? Uh, VPN tunnels are tunnels. They have an end. Exactly. And, and when you come out of the tunnel, you're not protected by it anymore. Right. Uh, so, for example, let's say that uh, I'm browsing the web and I'm on a forum and there's a malicious link in a forum post. Well, if I have a VPN tunnel up and I go to the forum and I click on that malicious link – all I'm doing is securely clicking on the malicious <laughs> yes, link, are. right? So it, yeah. it's still going to to uh, you know be up to me to know not to not to go to those random Google links to websites you've never heard of and then oh, download do an that? executable. Uh, that's a yeah. <laughs> so because <it>, if, <laughs> if you download an application, right? Uh, you downloaded an application. Yeah, it, it, it assumes you know what you're doing. Yeah. So what what do you recommend there? Like, how do we go that step further? Because the, the VPN tunnel solves one particular right. problem, which is if I'm at a hotel and I'm on a non-secure wireless network yep. and I bring up a tunnel, I don't have to worry about the other guests, the other people on that network attacking me. Right. But I still have to worry about the endpoints that I go to. So what, what else can we do beyond a VPN tunnel? Yeah, other than that, like Don said, you, we have to do our due diligence as an end user and not go, oh, what's this weird sketchy link that someone emailed me? Let's click on that. That looks amazing. Oh, Microsoft uh, Office is free. Yeah, awesome. Man, excellent. <laughs> You know, uh, there are things, other things we can do, uh, disabling um, Flash content, JavaScript. So we saw cross-site scripting. We want to disable the running of scripts in our browser. So that is a good way. So if you went to a website that had malicious code built into it, it would not execute said malicious code. You want to make sure that the security levels that you have built into your browser's security features are set to high or something higher than low, right? Uh, so that at least you have some. The the more you can increase the security functionality that's built in to your browsers, the more that can help with that. Run antivirus software so that if you do securely download that uh, crypto locker package, it's going to go, hey, this is probably bad for you. Uh, don't execute this. It's going to quarantine it and send it off. So I, th I think what we're getting at here is that browsing the internet, being on the internet, and, and, be, and being securely on the internet is it comes down to a lot of personal responsibility. Finding out what are the security mechanisms, and we could probably sit here all day and rattle off a laundry list of different things you can do. We're giving you the basics of 
Make sure you're running a pop-up blocker. Make sure that you're running that you're not running scripts. Make sure that if you're using Java, that it prompts you, which I think it does by default now. And you know, so even the vendors are seeing the the problems in their own software and trying to help you with that as well, because they they don't want you to have a bad experience and then not use them anymore. Which is exactly what was happening with Java and Flash. They were, you know, I, I just won't use you because you're the devil and you get me infected <laughs> every chance you can. And I don't want that anymore. What is so. it? Uh, fool me once, shame on you. Yeah. Fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, John was fooled us like 20 times. Bat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were sick of the death threats of, uh, of that stuff. So things that we can do, use the antivirus, use anti-malware, good, good surfing practices. Don't save passwords to your browser. If you want to do a password uh, management system, use something like LastPass, which is more secure. It uses encryption. It's not the browser itself. All these things built on top of each other is going to lead you to a better browsing experience, keep you safer. There is no perfect solution. There are just better solutions. And yes, while using uh, these things can can increase the headache of getting on the internet. It definitely decreases the headache of having your data stolen or having your uh, bank account wiped out because, or your your device locked up with a crypto locker virus. Um, uh, that is a bad day on anybody's street. So I, I, I just, I put up with the, the little headaches so that I avoid the big headaches. All right, now one thing you mentioned in there segues perfectly into our next question that came in from uh, hashtag ask me anything on Twitter, which is, uh, let's see, what how is this worded? It is, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, which antivirus software should I use, right? So you, you said you know, one of the things to yeah. help protect us is we can have antivirus for our weak moments, the weak moments <laughs> where we do click that link. We do download that file that we, we think is innocent. It comes yep. from a friend of ours, right? And and they, you know, Daniel gets an email. It says it's from me, and it's got a PDF in there, and he clicks on it, and all of a sudden, you know, crypto crypto locker yeah. or whatever, well, right? What are these so, little golden locks over all my files? <laughs> nice. So, uh, so we can run antivirus to help to to give us that second opinion, help protect us. But there is a ton of choice. I don't even know how many of these I could name from McAfee, Sophos, AVG, Avast, Kaspersky, Panda. I mean, there are a ton of antivirus products out there. Which one do you recommend, Daniel? That is a great question. I've used quite a few of them. I've used Kaspersky. I've used Symantec. I've used Panda. I've used AVG. I've used Avast. And here's the thing. It kind of goes back to uh, just what we were talking about a second ago. None of them are perfect. There are some that are better than others in general. There are some that are better than others specifically, right? So... There is no perfect solution to this. It really comes down to what are you willing to... A lot of times it comes down to what's your budget, to be honest with you. The ones that cost more typically work better across the board. It's just just the way it is. Uh, but there are some great free solutions. I do usually recommend Avast or AVG. Uh, they are great solutions. They work really great. i got to be honest with you. i got to give kudos to Microsoft Defender. It has really upped its game here lately. Um, so if you're running a Microsoft product, you've got one built in and hopefully you haven't turned it off. <laughs> uh, you know, we just did a little spot on the podcast earlier today where, um, in windows seven, there was a, a bug and Microsoft didn't push updates for windows defender for two weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, but, but they have been really great aside from that. And on windows 10, you continue to get those updates. So oh, windows defender has been really good. Uh, I know I personally use Sophos antivirus. Yep. I it, like group. the, um, it's not free, but it's like fifty dollars a year for five computers or something. It's very, oh, very yeah. inexpensive. Very cheap. Uh, so easy to manage and stuff. So I, I like that one. I think if you ask ten people, you hear ten different recommendations. Uh, Trend Micro is another one that does a, a oh, yeah. great job, uh, especially what is it, the, the enterprise house call space. What they have? Oh, house call for like a. If you ever want a second opinion, yeah. right? There's there's several of these that I call them second opinion software, right? <laughs> so if somebody comes to me and they say, "Ah, oh, my machine's infected." And I look, and they're running antivirus software. Well, obviously, their software missed it, yeah. right? So you need a second opinion. Uh, Trend Micro has what's called House Call. If you go to housecall.antivirus.com, it's free. You can download their Java-enabled virus scanner to do a one-time scan, right? Not, yep. not constant protection, but a one-time scan. And you can run through and make sure that your computer's clean or hopefully get it clean. Um, there's other systems like that. Google has the uh, virus total. Oh, yeah, right? virus total. So it, this is one that I use a lot. Uh, and and the, the scenario I always give is, let's say you work for a company and you're the HR director. You work in okay. human resources. People are emailing you resumes. 
That's a great scenario for this. It's your job to open those, <laughs> yeah, right? You, you must open them. <laughs> people, people you don't know are yep. sending you Word documents and PDFs, and it's your job to open them. So yeah. how, how can you how can you do that, right? <laughs> well, if you have good antivirus, maybe that'll catch you. Your email system likely has antivirus there, so maybe they catch it. But if you want a second opinion, you go to Virus Total. You upload that PDF to Virus Total, and Google runs it against like 50 different engines to see if there's known malware, Trojans, virus-like activity inside of that file. And you can do all that even before you open the file yourself. So it's a great way to get that. Obviously, it's not normal routine protection. No. That's why I call it kind of second opinion software. Yeah, I used to uh, use uh, Malwarebytes for that. I always yeah. found Malwarebytes to be a fantastic product. And it would, it uh, by and large caught everything that my antivirus didn't. Uh, so I've, I've had good experience with that. I've always liked it. But I also like VirusTotal now that uh, I've been playing around with like creating my own malicious uh, packages and seeing if VirusTotal catches it. And and sometimes they get through. Sometimes uh, they there, do. There's a, a Mac uh, virus going around right now. It's not truly a virus, but it, it's being distributed via Discord and Slack. That uh, it is a uh, it's targeting people who are mining cryptocurrency. Oh yeah, it's very, and very common. Virus Total clears the file. It passes because it's not actually like infecting your machine. It's just running a Bitcoin miner, and, yeah. and so it, it doesn't set up a red flag. What I like also about Virus Total is that you can hash the file. And take the hash and slap it into virus total, and it will check and see A, does it find it as a known signature? And B, what antivirus systems out there will detect this? And you can check and see if your system is on there if you are running an antivirus system. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because, um, you know, one thing I hear from people is, you know, what, what if it's not a resume? What if it's patient medical records, hmm. right? Well, I might not be allowed to upload those to Virus Total. That that would violate GDPR and that's any right. number of other things. And hey, maybe even the resume. Somebody sends me the resume. That's personally identifiable information. If I go and share that with Google, do I have the person's permission to do that? That's a good question. But if I just hash the file and I upload the hash, now I'm not uploading nope. the data. And if, if it is a virus, then Google already knows about it and we find it. So it's a, a way to kind of make sure that we're not disseminating personally identifiable information. Yes, very handy thing. I like the virus total. Gets our stamp of approval. <laughs> yeah, which I can't remember. Google bought that from Did somebody, they? right? Didn't they acquire yeah, I that? I want to say yeah. Yeah. I want to so, say they, they acquire everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? But, it's just going to, the world's going to be run by Amazon, Google, and what? Um, Apple. Yeah, Apple yeah. a little bit, and Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Walmart. Yeah. Got to throw their name in the hat, right? What are you going to do? Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the uh, the future ahead of us. Somewhat depressing. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, Daniel, I think let me let me just double check to make sure no other last minute questions came in. I think that's going to be the last one for our show today. Uh, it is indeed a uh, pretty good show. A lot of, of great topics, yeah, a, lot a lot of, of good information. And I want to encourage each and every one of you out there in TV land. If you have questions, feel free to share them with us. Jump into Twitter, post them a hashtag asks me anything. Go to the itpro.tv website, jump into the Q&A forums, post them there as well. We love to get questions from you, the viewers. No question is too, what is it? Uh, no, no question is too dumb. No fee That's is right. too big, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I got to get a Ghostbusters the Ghostbusters quote. There, right? like, no job is too small. No fee <laughs> is too big. big. That's yeah, what it was. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, throw your questions out there. We do absolutely love to hear them. And we did focus on security questions this time. It doesn't have to be security. Nope. Throw whatever question you want in there. If it's a question that's outside of a particular SME's realm of purview or whatever, <laughs> uh, we just pull those questions together and we answer them the next time we have the right SME on the show. There you go. So database questions, development, Microsoft Office, Adobe Creative Suite, uh, project management, IT governance, you, you name it. Development. Throw it out yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we get the SMEs to come in here and answer those. So definitely take advantage of that. And... If you really enjoyed the show, be sure to check out the IT Pro TV website, itpro.tv. Each and everything that we talked about in this episode gets covered in one course or another over in the IT Pro TV library. Um, a lot of the security basics we talked about are in the CompTIA Security Plus training that we have. Uh, Burp Suite. Yep. Daniel, you, you did a whole series on Burp Suite, yeah, right? I use Burp Suite cut extensively. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about that application, jump in there. And, and this guy's actually teaching it. Uh, he's all right to listen to. Yeah, so, I have my uh, days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So check that out. Uh, and then any of the other various topics. Uh, we have some antivirus training, but not a ton. I'm sure. Uh, that's a little subjective, I think. But yeah, uh, it is. But anyhow, be sure to check out the IT Pro TV library. It's a good time. Uh, a lot of good content in there, and we'd love to see you. That website is itpro.tv. Be sure to check it out. All right. Well, that's going to be a wrap for us. Daniel, thank you for joining us. 
And uh, for those of you out there in TV land, be sure to tune back in. The next time we have our Ask Me Anything up and running, we try and do it a couple of times a week. Jump in there, post your questions. We love to answer those. So signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Don Pizzette. I'm Daniel Lowry. And we will see you next time.